In this video, we're going to discuss the behavior of genes within the populations and the origin of species. Genetic variation in the populations plays a critical role for the process of evolution. Populations are generally genetically heterogeneous. In other words, different organisms within the population have different genetic makeup. This genetic variation is critical for evolution because it provides the raw material for the natural selection. Evolution is the change of the populations through the time. This change in the population phenotypical characteristics allow the population to adapt to changing environment. In other words, changing environment works as the source of selective pressure, source of the natural selection, which in turn drives evolutionary processes. The concept of natural selection as a driving force for evolution was proposed by Darwin, but he was not the first to propose that theory of evolution. However, he was the first to suggest that the underlying mechanism of evolution is the natural selection. Before Darwin, French scientist Lamarck proposed the, that the evolution was driven by the inheritance of acquired characteristics. If you look at this illustration, you can see that according to Lamarck, giraffe was trying to reach for the food on top of the tree and that attempt was stretching giraffe's neck. This elongated neck was inherited, and this giraffe would stretch its neck even longer, and that would be inherited. It wouldn't explain why, you know, if you chop off the foot of a rabbit, they still give birth to um, four-legged rabbits. So the idea of um, Darwin was different. So Darwin suggested that there was a, a phenotypical variability within the population of giraffes and some of them could access food on top of the tree much easier than others. Therefore, long-necked giraffes would have greater reproductive success. So at the end of the day, long-necked animals would survive and leave more progeny behind themselves, uh, demonstrating the role of natural selection in the process of evolution. Of course, Darwin didn't know about the genetic basis for the variation, but the main concept he caught it absolutely correctly. So the subject of population genetics is to study the behavior of genes within the population, not within the individual. Evolution inevitably results in the change in the genetic um, composition of a population, and that genetic variation is the raw material for natural selection. In populations that exist in nature, in other words, populations that are not um, the product of artificial selection by humans, genetic variation is a rule. One of the key underlying mechanisms of genetic variability in the populations is the existence of polymorphic loci. As you may remember, a locus is the term for the position of a gene on a chromosome. Polymorphic loci have more than one allele, and it's important that this allele exists, these, these different alleles exist in a population at the frequencies that are greater than um, the frequency determined by only mutations. Another important feature that facilitates genetic heterogeneity of the populations is heterozygosity. Heterozygosity can be defined as a probability that a randomly selected gene will be heterozygous 
in a randomly selected individual. Greater heterozygosity usually contributes to the greater genetic heterogeneity of the population. The corner store concept of population genetics is Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. A population exists in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium when the proportions of genotypes in that population do not change. Five key conditions for the population to be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium are the following. First, there should be no mutations in the population. Second, there should be no gene flow in or out of the population. In other words, no genes should be transferred into the population or out of it. The mating in the population should be random. Population have a very large size and there should be no selection. In other words, environment should be stable and should not impose any selective pressure on the population. As you can imagine, these conditions are very unrealistic. Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium can be written as an equation, and it is often used to calculate the frequencies of alleles in the populations that, in general, exist in the condition of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Let's say we have two alleles. Allele capital B, the dominant allele, is responsible for the black color of the coat in cats. The recessive allele, a small b, is responsible for white color of the coat in cats. The frequencies for each allele can be um, determined as P and Q. So what is the frequency? Frequency is the percentage of the allele P in the population and therefore P plus Q equals 1. So in other words, if you have a population of 100 cats and 60 cats have allele P, and you can, among 100 cats, you can find 60 alleles P, then P will be 0 0.6. So now the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium can be described by the following equations. And we need to figure out where this P squared, 2PQ and Q squared come from. If you think about this, if the probability of a particular animal have an allele P is 0 0.6, then probability of having two alleles P is P multiplied by P for the homozygous dominant genotype, Q multiplied by Q for homozygous recessive genotype, and the total probabilities of having heterozygous genotype will be as follows. If P comes from the male father and Q comes from the female, this is the product of multiplication of P and Q, but P, on the other hand, can come from the mother and Q can come from the father. So this is another PQ. Therefore, 2 PQ. So this demonstrates how we can calculate the frequencies of different genotypes in the population. If we know that the frequency of the recessive allele is, sorry, the recessive homozygous recessive phenotype 0 0.16, first of all, we know that it is Q squared. So square root of 0 0.16 is 0 0.4. Now, we can't really distinguish homozygous uh, dominant and heterozygous, but uh, we now can deduce that P will be 0 0.6 and calculate the rest. 
So if you look at this, so the frequency of um, the um, allele that is dominant will be 0 0.36 plus half of the 2PQ. Another way to calculate the frequency of an allele. Now, this Punnett square shows you how these probabilities work. So, homozygous dominant will be the squared of P, the probability of having the P allele in the sperm or the egg is 0 0.6. The homozygous recessive genotype will be Q squared, and you're going to have two PQs for two heterozygous genotypes. So what Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium tells us that if all five assumptions that we mentioned before are correct, i.e. no mutation, no gene flow, random mating, large population, and no selection, then the frequencies of alleles and genotypes in the population do not change from one generation to another. Of course, populations usually do not meet all five assumptions. Therefore, we can look for changes in frequency of specific phenotypes or genotypes and propose hypotheses that could explain which processes drive these changes in frequencies. First of all, let's talk about mutations. So mutation rates in the populations of higher eukaryotes, such as animals and plants, are fairly infrequent. So although mutations are indeed the ultimate source for the variation, but individual mutations occur very rarely. So mutations alone usually do not change the allele frequency very much. Now, what about gene flow? So gene flow is the movement of the genetic information either in the population or out of it. It's easier to think about movement of genes into the population, and it's an extremely potent agent that promotes genetic changes in the population. Non-random mating. Mating that occurs, uh, f that follows certain principles. In assortative mating, individuals mate because of the similarities. The ultimate result of assortative mating is inbreeding. It doesn't usually alter the frequency of the alleles, but usually changes the proportion of heterozygotic organisms in the population. Disassortative mating, on the other hand, is the mating based on the genetic or phenotypical differences. And it usually results in the outbreeding. Genetic drift. So what is it? Genetic drift is example of statistical accidents. When the frequency of an allele changes due to the random chance. Usually the magnitude of this change is negatively related to the size of the population. In other words, the um, smaller populations experience greater genetic drift, while in larger population, it will be um, larger populations will be affected by the genetic drift less than the small ones. Two classic examples of the genetic drift are founder effect and the bottleneck effect. So 
for example, in the uh, this is the example of the bottleneck effect. Um, the parent population on this illustration, as you can see, contains green, yellow, and red beans. But when the new population, modal population, is formed within the beaker, so to say, um, you can see that when this population starts to reproduce, individuals start to reproduce, there are no more red genotypes. So first of all, you can see that genetic drift affects rare alleles more. So in isolated populations, genetic drift usually results in the loss of alleles, and the alleles to be lost first are the rare ones. Another example are, for instance, the populations of um, sea elephants um, on the islands when, in this case, genetic drift results in the massive phenotypical uh, change and you can see that this population that originally was formed in at the island of Guadalupe now spreads throughout the western uh, coast of North America. So this is the founder effect. In founder effect, um, the small population that for instance moves to an island establishes the new population with a, a considerably different frequencies of genotypes. Finally, selection is one of the most important agents of evolutionary changes. It's relatively simple. Some individuals leave behind more progeny. That's it. That's pretty much all. Leaving more progeny. Greater reproductive success is what natural selection is all about. And the rate of that greater reproduction success is affected, obviously, by the phenotype of individuals and their behavior. However, for um, natural selection to occur, three conditions should be, uh, should be followed. And these conditions are variation, heritability of the beneficial traits, and the different reproductive success. This is true for both artificial selection, which is driven by humans, and natural selection, which is driven by the selective pressures imposed on populations by nature. So you need to understand that natural selection and evolution are not the same things. Selection is the process. It's one of the several processes that can result in the evolution of populations. Well, the evolution is the outcome of the change through time, which is driven by the natural selection. The result of evolution that is driven by the natural selection is adaptation. In other words, Natural selection is the ultimate and only agent that can produce adaptive, natural, evolutionary changes. And we need to define what adaptation is, but adaptation is the ability to survive and leave offspring under um, the particular conditions in the environment. So one of the good examples of natural selection that results in evolution are common sulfur butterflies. Caterpillars of common sulfur butterflies usually have pale green color which allows them to hide from predators in the leaves. That explains why um, variant which has bright blue color is very rare and kept at the low frequency. 
we mentioned that before that the only agent that produces adapt adaptive evolutionary changes is the selection so this blue color morphed morphs are more vulnerable to the predation another example are pocket mice in this illustration you can see that pocket mice that survive on the black rocks have the black fur color and the pocket mice that survive in the sand have light brown color which both in both cases allows them to avoid uh, as as much as they can predation and if there is any cross species transfer for instance the light brown colored mice on the black rock will be quickly eliminated another example of the natural uh, selection that is driven by the selective pressure is the resistance to pesticides and houseflies so there are genes pen kdr and dldr pen gene in this example it decreases the uptake of insecticide and kdr and dldr genes decrease the number of target sites for the pesticide in both cases presence of these alleles increases the survivability of the house flies so in other words house flies with those genes have a greater fitness so what is the fitness fitness is the ability of the individuals to leave more offspring and survive pretty much those things are inextricably linked the survival and the ability to produce more offspring what's important is that that reproductive success should be greater than reproductive success of other um, phenotypes fitness is the relative concept um, most fit phenotype as you can see from this definition is the one that produces the greatest number of offspring and the relative fitness of two phenotypes can be tested well by the number of offspring that each phenotype produces and what's important number of offspring that survives and and uh, manages to produce further new offspring so you can imagine it's not that easy to measure the relative fitness of two phenotypes so what are the key components of fitness first of all it's survival so whether or not the organism well can survive then it is sexual selection so the phenotype that is beneficial should be selected during mating in other words immediately non-random mating number of offspring per mate per mating so um, couples that produce more viable and survivable offspring per mating will have a greater chance to pass their genes down to uh, down the generations however you have to appreciate that traits that are favorable for one uh, outcome can be disadvantages for another for instance bright color of the um, feathers and I don't know large plumage of feathers can be an advantage for the uh, preferential mating for that um, male for instance so it will favor sexual selection and um, will ultimately result for that this particular individual to produce more offspring however uh, it may actually be not favorable for the survival because these organisms are more noticeable for the predators so the outcome in terms of the selection is the greater number of the offspring produced that's it so here's an example how one how nature favors sort of an intermediate phenotype so here you can see the number of number of eggs that is laid by a single female water strider and you can see that the larger the water strider is the more eggs it can lay but you can also see that the larger female water striders have shorter lifespan so overall um, 
the phenotype with the intermediate length will be favored because they will have the optimal lifespan, but still they will lay a pretty significant amount of eggs. The smaller um, phenotypes won't be able to produce as much eggs, and the greater phenotypes, larger phenotypes, won't be able to survive. Therefore, these intermediate-sized females have the highest fitness compared to other phenotypes. Interactions between the populations and within the population may counter the selection. Mutations and genetic drift. Well, mutations, because they are fairly rare, they rarely um, counter the selection in a population. However, random genetic drift can affect the process of selection. Remember, selection is non-random, while genetic drift is. Selection is non-random in the sense that selection in the population occurs due to the certain selective pressures. We already learned that genetic drift may decrease the frequency of alleles in isolated populations, especially it can reduce the frequency of more rare alleles. And if these rare alleles are generally favored by selection, this is how genetic drift can counter the selection itself. However, selection often can overwhelm genetic drift except in the small populations. Um, selection can also be um, countered by the process of gene flow. Remember the movement of genes inside or outside of the population. Gene flow can be constructive, in which the beneficial mutations, beneficial alleles are spread to other populations. And the uh, constructive genetic drift essentially makes um, it enhances the adaptability of the population. Genetic drift can also be constraining. It impedes the adaptation within the population because the inferior alleles flow in from other populations. Now, for example, slender bent grass grows at copper mines. Turns out that the allele that provides resistance to the toxins in the soil, it is very common in the areas near copper mines, but the frequency of that resistance allele occurs at very much lower intermediate levels in other areas. Probably the reason for this is that the resistance gene makes the grass grow slower when the soil is not contaminated. When you look at this graph, you can clearly see that the copper tolerance, in other words, the frequency of the resistance allele, is very high in the grass that grows at the mine side. But when pollen is moved by the wind away from the mine, the frequency of this allele, in other words, the index of copper tolerance is much less frequent. It is rare because this allele represents the constraining gene for the adaptation to the growth in the soil that is not contaminated. How is variation maintained or in sometimes changed? So selection can depend on the frequency of the particular phenotype. We call it frequency dependent selection, not surprisingly. So frequency dependent selection can be, first of all, positive and negative. Negative frequency dependent selection occurs when rare phenotypes are favored by the selective pressure. 
for example, when rare phenotypes are not in the search image of a predator. Positive frequency dependent selection favors the common phenotype. In other words, it eliminates phenotypical variation in a population due to the oddballs standing out. An example of negative frequency dependent selection is the water boatman. This insect demonstrates that the most common color type is much preferred by the fish that consumes it. You can see the dark brown phenotype being eaten more frequently when color type frequency increases. This dark brown phenotype consumption increases. On the other hand, light brown um, phenotype, which is less frequent, provides much less um, food, let's put it this way, for the fish. And that distribution shows that the probability of an insect with a particular phenotype to be eaten is greater than the chance alone, because probably dark brown animals are more noticeable for fish. An example of positive frequency dependent selection is this, when this predator here would consume that fish that stands out from the rest of the population. It is very well exemplified by um, the, the difference in coloration in different populations of guppies, the example that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. So in addition to positive and negative frequency depending selection, selection can also be oscillating. So you can see on this illustration that the big depth in Darwin finches in Galapagos Islands depends on whether the year is dry or not. In the dry year, big depth increases because it's more beneficial for finding food. In the wet year, it actually big depth decreases because food is more abundant. So in other words, oscillating selection is the process in which selective pressure favors one phenotype at one time and another phenotype at another time. The effect of oscillating selection is maintaining the genetic variation in the population. Another important concept that we need to touch upon is so-called heterozygote advantage. In many populations, heterozygotes are favored over homozygote organisms. If heterozygotes have the advantage, only if they have an advantage, heterozygote advantage allows to maintain both alleles in the population. An example of this is a sickle cell anemia, a heritage hereditary disease that affects the hemoglobin structure. Altered hemoglobin cannot cause enough, cannot carry enough oxygen, which results in the severe anemia. And usually homozygotes for sickle cell allele, usually they die before reproducing. What I want to highlight about this is that uh, it is a homozygous recessive condition. So the question is, if homozygotes are dying before they are able to reproduce, why is this allele not eliminated? Well, as you can see, the frequency of the um, sickle cell allele in sub-Saharan Africa greatly overlaps with the geographical presence of the pathogen Plasmodium falciparum that causes malaria. Malaria is one of the leading causes of death in sub-Saharan Africa, and turns out that heterozygotes for sickle cell allele do not suffer from anemia, and much less susceptible to malaria compared to healthy homozygous dominant individuals. This is why this allele is preserved in the population.
So what if a trait is affected by more than one gene? Well, in this case, selection operates on all genes for such polygenic trait. And the population, the frequency of different genes in the population uh, will be changed depending on which genotypes are in greater favor in these specific circumstances. Selection, in terms of its directionality, can be disruptive, directional, and stabilizing. So what happens in the disruptive selection? In disruptive selection, as you can see, intermediate types here, they are eliminated and extremes are favored. So for instance, in African black-bellied seedcracker finch, um, you can observe two very different big sizes. Because the seeds that are available as food fall into two categories based by the size. And that size distribution of food favors the bill sizes for either one type or another, which actually may result eventually in a possible speciation event. Here on this illustration, you can see that the large beak allows finches to eat large seeds, while small beak allows them to feed on smaller seeds, which puts birds with the intermediate-sized beaks at a great disadvantage, making them jacks of all trades and masters of none. In the process of directional selection, one of the extremes is eliminated. So you can see that the peak of this normal distribution shifts to the right or to the left. So for example, if um, the selective pressure selects for the large individuals, the average body size of a population will increase. So for instance, flies can move towards the light and turns out in Drosophila you can artificially select flies that move away from the light. So why? Well, if the fly has a habit, so to say, to move towards the light, it will die. Therefore, the percent of the um, flies, they tend to exhibit such behavior, reduced overpopulation because simply those who fly towards the light get killed. Finally, in stabilizing selection, extremes are eliminated and the intermediate phenotype is more favored. So, for example, such um, selection occurs in, the, in regards to the birth weight of human babies. You can imagine that the lower birth weight is associated with a greater infant mortality, while the extremely large birth weight is associated with the uh, um, complications during birth. That is why the intermediate um, size of a baby is selected for. Uh, various experimental studies were carried out to investigate what happens and how selection occurs. Some of the studies focused on the fossils or uh, DNA sequencing, looking for the DNA evidence. But also there were some studies on the fruit flies. These studies were common for the last 50 years. And recently some other lab and field experiments were performed to study the selection process. So one of such studies was the study of guppy coloration. Guppy are the fish that are found in the small streams in South America. Some guppies are capable of colonizing portions of the streams above waterfalls, while other species are not able to make it upstream and exist below the waterfalls. So the waterfalls, representing essentially the dispersal barriers, create two vastly different environments for guppies. One such environment 
is characterized by the almost complete lack of natural predator, predators for guppies. More specifically, predators are much less frequent above the waterfalls. These natural predators, called pike cichlids, are rare above the waterfalls. There are predators called killfish, but killfish does not target guppies in particular. So the effect of the absence of such predation is that guppies above the waterfall have much uh, brighter coloration. However, when predators are present, guppies with the brighter colors are more easily targeted by pike cichlids and are eaten, which results in a population having less bright coloration due to the natural selection imposed on this population by cichlids. In the field situation, we can't really account for other variables. So in order to study this uh, phenomenon in more standardized conditions, the lab study was performed on the guppy populations. So there were 10 large pools in four Guppies were mixed with pike cichlids. In four, they were mixed with killfish. Remember, while cichlids are predators, killfish are not. And two pools with guppies were left as controls. Uh, scientists spent 14 months and 10 generations of guppies and observed the changes in the coloration between the killfish and control pools versus the pools with pike cichlids. You can see that in the conditions that favor formation, that, that have no predation, a very low predation, guppies were much brighter colored, while in the condition with a high predation in the pools with pike cichlids, the coloration of guppies was less bright because that was the selective pressure imposed on them. So what can limit the process of selection? First of all, phenotypic effects of alleles that are multiple. So if one allele has multiple phenotypic outcomes, it can limit the ability of a particular um, selective pressure to drive the adaptation. Lack of genetic variation in the population. That's very characteristic for the populations of animals or plants that are the result of the artificial selection driven by humans. For instance, thoroughbreds, the horses, um, you can see that um, the artificial selection resulted in the dramatic reduction of the winning time for the Kentucky Derby, but most recently that winning time kind of stabilized. So there is no more adaptation due to the lack of genetic variation. In some cases, phenotypic variation may not have a genetic basis. In this case, like being, um, you know, we mentioned it, that in class, being a, a great, like a good soccer player, probably does not have a direct genetic basis. Finally, the epistasis. Epistasis represents the interactions between different genes. So the advantage that a single allele provides in a certain environment may vary from one genotype to another because different genotypes may have different genes, different alleles that exist in the epistasis with the allele of interest influencing its expression. This is an example of the phenotype that does not have genetic basis. On Matidia, the individual fragments of the eye of the fly, the number of this omatidia does not have a genetic basis. Now, in the last chapter here, we're going to talk about the origin of species. So, first we need to define how we, you know, identify species. So, the concept of species must explain two phenomena. 
the differences between the species that live together at the single locality and the ability of different populations of the same species to connect with each other. Species are called sympatric if they exist in the same geographical area. Sympatric species are very distinctive entities and are phenotypically different, even if they look alike to us. They often use different parts of habitat and they have different behavior. Now, we need to clearly delineate the differences between the species and some subspecies. The term subspecies refers to various populations that belong to the same species but serve more like the connection between the populations in different geographical regions. Subspecies are usually well geographically separated and as we mentioned before these intermediate forms such as this intergrade form um, that is common in the parts of Tennessee um, North Carolina and Virginia, this intergrade form may serve as the connection between different subspecies of the milk snakes, such as scarlet king snake, characteristic for Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, red milk snake, that is characteristic for Arkansas, Missouri, Kansas, and eastern milk snake, which is characteristic for uh, American Northeast, Ohio, and Michigan. All these four subspecies of snakes are the same species, but they look slightly different. So how do we define species biologically? Well, uh, Mayer defines species based on their reproduction. So reproduction-based definition of species states that uh, species composed of populations which members can mate with each other and the result of that mating is fertile and survivable offspring. In other words, species can arise due to the reproductive isolation and species exist in reproductive isolation from other species. Reproduct what can facilitate the reproductive isolation of different species? First of all, it can be prezygotic isolation that prevents the formation of a zygote. And it also can be post-zygotic isolation, which um, explains the low survivability of hybrids. So several mechanisms of prezygotic isolation exist. Geographic when um, the isolation based on different um, regions where species exist. Ecological isolation, where species occupy different ecological niches. Behavioral isolation, where species behavior prevents them from mating with each other. Temporal isolation, for instance, diurnal and nocturnal species or species that mate in different times. Mechanical isolation, when uh, the fusion of gametes is impossible due to certain mechanical barriers. Gamete fusion can be prevented, for instance, in animals with external fertilization. We're gonna talk about it. And as we mentioned, posigotic mechanisms include for the most part inviability or infertility of hybrids. So ecological isolation, for instance, occurs between different uh, populations of large pre predatorial cats um, that may exist in the same area but um, occupy different ecological niches. Behavioral isolation between birds when two distinct bird species behave differently that prevents mating. Reproductive isolation um, in sympatric species can be explained uh, through behavioral isolation here. For example, when species emit different visual signals, 
auditory signals or chemical signals such as pheromones. Even electrical signals can contribute to the behavioral isolation preventing the hybridization between the species. Um, temporal isolation. So wild lettuce can grow alongside the uh, U.S. roads in the southeastern United States, but uh, they don't form fertile hybrids in the nature. They can be made experimentally, but in the nature, these fertile hybrids are rare because one species of wild lettuce flowers in the spring and another one in the summer, which means that pollination between these two is pretty much impossible. Mechanical isolation, or parts don't feed. Bees carry pollen from one species of plants to a certain, another species of plants on their bodies. But if this area on the bodies does not come in contact with the receptive structures of, fl of receiving flowers, pollination does not occur. Finally, prevention of gamete fusion, external fertilization of, for instance, frog eggs can be prevented by the streams, by some behavioral issues, so uh, that can result in the prezygotic isolation of species. Now, what about postzygotic isolation mechanisms? For instance, leopard frogs that are very common in the United States and Mexico, they form a group of related species, which hybrids cannot be produced even in the laboratory conditions. Hybrids that survive are often weaker, and many hybrids can be sterile, for instance, due to abnormal development of sex organs. In some cases, such a case of Liger, we mentioned it in class, hybrids fail to form gametes. However, often the formation of hybrids may signal the beginning of the speciation and production of another species. So biological species concept gained a lot of criticism because reproductive isolation may not be the only force that manages to maintain the integrity of the species. Also, it is well known that for plants and for birds, interspecific, interspecific hybridization exists. Up to 50% of California plants cannot be defined by genetic isolation, and 10% of all bird species in the world can hybridize in nature. And on top of that, what about species that reproduce asexually, such as bacteria? Biological species concept cannot be applied to them at all or species that can produce hybrids in captivity. Another concept that can define the species is the ecological concept. So when distinctions between the species are maintained by the natural selection. The selection that is stabilizing, we mentioned that before, maintains the adaptation of species to certain environments, which means hybrids that differ phenotypically from the original species are eliminated from the gene pool rapidly. So reproductive isolation can often result in so-called cladogenesis, the formation of new groups of taxa. For instance, when ancestral species divide into two descendant species through the event of speciation. Now, we're going to still stick to the process of reproductive isolation as the source of speciation, and we're going to try to answer the question, how is the process of speciation related to the reproductive isolation? So, um, species are constantly formed in nature. It's a continuous process, and selection may actually reinforce the mechanisms that drive reproductive isolation. So, for instance, the populations may only be partially isolated reproductively. Then the phenomenon of reinforcement occurs. Um, 
these incomplete isolating mechanisms can be reinforced by natural selection until those um, those uh, that that selection that that speciation is completely effective. However, the process of reinforcement uh, may not be inevitable. I mentioned before that hybrids are often inferior, but if they are fertile, they may serve as conduits of genetic exchange between two partially reproductively isolated populations. So for instance, here, um, two populations of flycatchers, colored and pied flycatcher, they are not completely reproductively isolated because the hybrids between two populations serve as the conduits of genetic material between the two. So sometimes random changes can cause reproductive isolations. We know these random changes as genetic drift. As we mentioned before, genetic drift is most notable in the small populations because in the small populations it can eliminate certain alleles from the population uh, pro providing better conditions for the reproductive isolation. And we already know that the founder effect, the appearance of the population, small population on an island, for example, or the bottleneck effect due to the, some catastrophic event may result in a speciation. For instance, um, Drosophila populations on Hawaiian islands are different from the ancestors in the mating behaviors, which may be a result of the founder effect. Often adaptation to the environment may lead to speciation. When populations adapt to different circumstances, they can accumulate the differences, which may lead to reproductive isolation. For instance, the changes in the dewlap color that are related to environment in these lizards could lead to the reproductive isolation from the ancestral population. The speciation often depends on geography. Uh, the speciation here is usually a two-part process. The populations that are initially identical must diverge. And reproductive isolation must emerge to maintain the differences between the two. The gene flow in this case that would connect those populations would limit the reproductive isolation and would hinder the speciation in this case. In other words, speciation is more likely in populations that are isolated geographically. We call such process allopatric speciation. Populations that are geographically separated are more likely to develop substantial differences that may lead to speciation. For instance, little paradise can fissure varies little throughout its normal range, but its isolated populations are strikingly different between each other and from the main late population. Here you can see the mainland population of kingfishers. Isolated island populations are very different, for instance, in the coloration of the feathers from the mainland population due to the allopatric speciation event. So allopatric speciation can be described using the following example. In this original population, the gene flow occurs freely. However, the obstruction of the riverbed changes the direction of the river flow separating the original population into two subpopulations red and green. These two are now isolated from one another. Gene flow within each population occurs freely, but there is no gene flow between the populations because of the river. Over the next thousands of years, these populations are exposed potentially to different selective pressures and adapt to the selective pressures accordingly. In other words, these two subpopulations, red and green, become physically and reproductively isolated. 
And even though this barrier, barrier, the river can be removed eventually, and these two populations will merge together, they won't be able to mate because now it's not subpopulations, it's two different species. One that emerged from what we called red and another that emerged from what we called green. So to summarize, allopatric speciation, it occurs in the conditions of geographic isolation. There should be some uh, sort of geographical barrier that separates two populations. There should be lack of migration between these two population and therefore lack of gene flow. And all these conditions may result in the reproductive isolation, which prevents, uh, which will be both, both pre-zygotic and post-zygotic. Upon the second contact, though, those populations will mingle but will not produce any offsprings because now the speciation is completed. Now, what about sympatric speciation? The event when two populations exist in the same environment but still become reproductively isolated. It can happen without geographic isolation usually due to the different ecological niches or the result of polyploidy. Polyploidy is the situation when an individual contains more than two sets of chromosomes. In other words, not two homologous chromosomes per pair, but more than that. Polyploidy is very well known among plants, for example. Polyploidy can be auto or allo. In autopolyploidy, all chromosomes arise from single species. For example, an error in cell division results in the production of tetraploid organisms. And tetraploids cannot produce fertile offspring with normal diploids, but can produce with the species like, you know, tetraploids as well. In allopolyploidy, do species hybridize and the offspring has one copy of chromosomes of each species. This offspring is infertile because it cannot reproduce with either species, but it can reproduce asexually. If for some reason the number of chromosomes doubles spontaneously due to the mistakes during meiosis and that pretty much polyploidy, that offspring will become fertile. Here's an example. Species 2 and species 1 both provide a haploid set of chromosomes for a hybrid which now has five chromosomes, two from species 2 and three from species 1. When the number of these chromosomes isn't doubled, um, this, they can't form pairs, okay? And they cannot go through meiosis. So they can't form gametes. Gametes are sterile, so sexual reproduction is not possible. But if due to the mistaken cell division, the chromosomal number is doubled, now this cell can go through meiosis, producing the viable gamete, which can reproduce with another similar tetraploid. Polyploidy, as I mentioned before, is very common in plants um, for the most part. So sympatric speciation can happen over the course of multiple generation because of the disruptive selection. So imagine there is a population that contains two different phenotypes. If these phenotypes evolve to develop reproductive isolating mechanisms, they can form two species. Alternatively, these um, different phenotypes can be retained as polymorphism within the single population. Now we need to define the concept of adaptive radiation. So adaptive radiation is the diversification of a common ancestor due to the different environment in which this offspring can form wide variety of forms. So usually, adaptive radiation occurs 
within the unstable and changing environments with few other species and many resources. Examples are Hawaiian and Galapagos Islands, very little competition, significant amount of unused resources, facilitates adaptive radiation on the islands. Adaptive radiations can also arise after catastrophic events um, because of the elimination of certain competition within the environment. What is the key innovation? Key innovation is a new trait that evolves and allows species to use the resources that were previously inaccessible, changing the whole evolutionary picture in the environment. For instance, development of lungs in fish and wings in birds are considered to be key innovation. Key innovation requires both speciation and adaptation to different habitats. Key innovations are often um, observed in the separate species living on different islands. So species can evolve different adaptations in allopatric environment and then result in the island colonization or they can colonize islands first and then evolve different adaptations to minimize interspecies competition. So the character displacement is the process due to the natural selection within the species. So differences in phenotypical trait within the species can alter the use of some environmental resource. The differences in resource utilization will increase in frequency over time, and that will result in the divergence of species. And the overall effect essentially is the disruptive evolution. So here you can see the character displacement here. So uh, within the same population, the species speciation will occur because, for instance, individuals which are more most different from each other will be favored by natural selection because that will reduce the competition for the same resource and will favor the um, species with the largest difference. So, for instance, examples of speciation, classic examples of speciation are, for instance, Hawaiian Drosophila, uh, which consists of more than 1,000 species. They exhibit a diversity of morphological and behavioral traits, and they are example of adaptive radiation. The habitats that were empty resulted in the fruit flies that are predators, parasites, herbivores, detritivores, nectar eaters. What can be a better example of adaptive radiation than this? Same is true for Darwin's pinches. They reached the islands before other land birds, so they had very little competition and abundant resources. Uh, different selective pressures on different islands promoted the new lifestyle of those finches, and that resulted in the geographic isolation and speciation in many islands. Even within the same population, finches evolved in the separate species and now managed to occupy many different habitats. So these differences between the species of finches likely come from the character displacement. For instance, there are ground finches that feed on seeds uh, on the ground, and the size of the bills relates to the size of the seed that they eat. Then there are tree finches that eat insects. Uh, there's pretty much one species. They use the tools to get insects. And then there are vegetarian finches that eat buds from the branches and have a big shaped specifically for this and finally there are warbler finches that eat insects from the leaves and the branches now another example is cichlid fishes in the lake victoria so it had massive number of cichlids up to 300 species 
The first cichlids arrived to the Lake Victoria roughly 200,000 years ago, and continuous changes to water level facilitated the formation of species. Now, for instance, lake dried down 14,000 years ago, which forced cichlids to develop a diversity in the feeding modes, from mud biters and algae scrapers to the fish that chew leaves, eat snails, zooplankton, insects, prawn, and other fish. So this massive diversification of the uh, feeding patterns can be described as the key innovation. However, uh, in the last several decades, cichlids in Lake Victoria are exposed to extinction. The reason for this, the introduction of the Nile perch. Nile perch generates an enormous amount of competition to cichlids, and from 1950s to 1990s, from the moment of introduction of Nile perch into the lake, up to 70% of cichlids gone extinct. Another example of speciation is the speciation of New Zealand alpine buttercups, the plants. In this case, the speciation and diversification was promoted by the cycles of the glaciers advancing and retreating. Now there are 14 species of New Zealand alpine buttercups that occupy five distinct habitats. These habitats are different based on the elevation. So you can see snow fields are the highest, snowline fringe is next, stony debris, uh, uh, the slopes at the certain elevation, sheltered habitats, and finally boggy habitats. If you look at this image here, you can see the differences in the appearance between those buttercups that grow in different environments. All of this was made possible by the uh, movement of the glacier line. Now, what about the pace of evolution? Is it slow and constant or rapid and punctuated? Uh, gradualism was the dominant idea for a long time and promoted the idea that evolution is the accumulation of small changes. So you can see gradualism on the left side of the panel. Punctuated equilibrium gained traction later and suggested that evolution goes through long periods of stasis, which are interspersed by rapid change of stabilizing of uh, disruptive selection. Selection that is stabilizing and oscillating is responsible for the stasis, while disruptive selection is responsible for the evolution. Now, we understand that these two concepts are basically two ends of the same continuum. Now, what about the balance between speciation and extinction? We know that both um, processes occur at the same time. Species go extinct and new species arise. Over time, we know that there were five mass extinctions. Most severe happened at the end of the Permian period, and the most famous was at the end of Cretaceous when dinosaurs went extinct. Causes of mass extinction were changes in the environment, volcanic activity, uh, ecological changes in the populations, sometimes aided by catastrophic events such as meteors. So in mass extinctions, not all groups are affected equally. For instance, previously dominant groups may suffer, which completely changes the course of evolution. For instance, during the Cretaceous mass extinction, the disappearance of dinosaurs paved the way for mammals to dominate the Earth. Diversity of the populations usually rebounds after the mass extinction, but it may take up to 10 million years to reach the previous levels of the population diversity. Now, right now, the extinction technically is underway. Um, the 25% of all species may become extinct in the near future. You can see that the number of families, the rate at which it is formed, is slowing down and may be reversed uh, very soon. And the rebound will be slower because humans take resources from the animals. Other differences? Well, we directly destroy some species and change the environments much more rapidly than the nature usually changes it. So we're going to talk about sexual selection a little bit more.
already mentioned the guppy coloration. So guppies prefer brightly colored males. But and males that are found in areas that have no predators are brightly colored, which is not surprising because predators focus on the guppies that are bright. So they will be eliminated first and that will result in the duller color of guppies in the areas with predators. Uh, manipulative experiments that we talked about actually confirm uh, that idea. Um, same idea, sword length in male sword tails. The longer swords are preferred by females. Pesticide resistance. So this is a very interesting story because uh, cockroaches have evolved to have the resistance to pesticide called combat. And it combat is a very strong selective pressure. However, these resistant cockroaches have a mutation that makes them to dislike glucose. Now, in terms of the resistance to pesticides in general, uh, in every pesticide has at least one species of insects that is resistant to it. Same story is for pathogen resistance. Pathogens uh, facilitate the development of resistance in various species by killing the weaker individuals. So now uh, we're going to skip some of the um, some of the ideas and we're going to just going to mention the anolis lizards that were introduced on the islands in Bahamas um, with with small bushes and no trees originally lizards were from island with thickly branched trees so that forced the um, uh, uh, formation of long legs which facilitated their survival in the new environment and end result is the speciation of lizards to new species because of the different selective pressures.